welcome you to uh, live interactions with uh, global change makers we have people from across uh, india over here and from uh, different companies um, uh, from birlas to aqua aqua craft and uh, uh, we have people from gmr group and many uh, more so i'd like to welcome everyone over here uh, live interactions with global change makers is an initiative by international institute for csr which is a dedicated research uh, and development and training institution for csr and sustainability uh, this pro in this program we have media partners uh, denik baskar which is our outreach partner and dedicated to sustainable development and sdg chopal which is a national initiative by niti aayog until 2030 and has a mission to reach all 700 plus districts and 6 lakhs plus uh, villages enabling localizations of sdgs in a 10 year long initiative in different parts uh, of the rural villages and hr foundation uh, which promotes uh, unanimous growth uh, thank you uh, mr kumar for uh, joining us Uh, may I request um, others to switch off the camera since we would be recording this, and towards the end of it, we will uh, request or everyone to switch on the camera, and we'll have a group picture. Okay. Uh. Uh, so mr kumar uh, it's wonderful to uh, see you and uh, have you among us today um so the format would be i'll be asking you a few questions and then i will be leaving it to the audience to uh, ask their set of uh, questions um you've been with reliance foundation um uh, since more than a decade and you've grown up the ladder how has the experience been and what has been your walk of life uh, professionally with them well it's been uh, an exciting and exhilarating journey uh, as being for part of this foundation uh, i've been with the group for uh, two decades in fact uh, it's been a transition as well uh, for me from the business to the uh, non profit side uh, some of it uh, running in parallel as well so for me uh, the journey with the foundation started even before uh, this uh, whole thing about csr uh, the momentum in india uh, that started uh, this momentum actually picked up more uh, post 2014 or the 2014 onwards uh, uh, thanks to the amendments in the companies act and so on but my journey with this uh, started prior to that uh, more towards uh, uh, the overall development space that's how it's been for me so our reliance foundation uh, is very active and uh, known for its work in the rural areas of india how would you define integrated village development and what are the location of operations for rrel and uh, success indicators according to you so uh, rural development and rather rural transformation as we call it is uh, a, a, an important part of our uh, initiatives uh, verticals um, that we have in fact uh, there is a first of the verticals that we started uh, Uh, as a separate entity in the form of uh, foundation while reliance industries has been uh, at the forefront in terms of uh, carrying out various philanthropic activities prior to that too in uh, multiple areas including rural uh, development but uh, this gained more momentum uh, once we had set up this foundation uh, where we started working uh, in several states uh, primarily with the objective of bridging the divide between urban and the rural india through our flagship program called the bharat india jodo as it as you can imagine that basically means bridging uh, bharat with uh, india so that bridging is by uh, doing several things uh, to start with uh, uh, bridging the income inequality and uh, providing them the opportunities basically equality of opportunities uh, leading to uh, bridging these uh, differences one of the important things was uh, to ensure that uh, people have uh, adequate livelihoods there 
and uh, with agri being the uh, primary occupation there to make sure that uh, uh, the farmers don't have to desert their lands and uh, you know migrate uh, uh, for other jobs uh, for the sake of uh, livelihood so how do you how do you make this attractive for them how do you uh, make this sustainable for them uh, and uh, how do we retain them uh, where they are so that uh, they can live a dignified uh, and empowered life. That's been the primary objective of uh, our uh, effort into uh, rural transformation. And we have been operating this uh, in uh, 12 states across the country. Basis being, uh, we picked up uh, some of the most uh, underdeveloped uh, areas. Uh, and again, since we said, I said agrees, uh, the primary livelihood there, how do we, set up models of development in these places where we are working so that they can be replicated across the country in similar uh, agroecological uh, sub-regions. So we picked up uh, diverse agroecological sub-regions uh, so that we are able to set up this model for each of those uh, agroecological sub-regions. So we are actually operating in 19 such uh, uh, agroecological sub-regions uh, within the country. So in the COVID-19 times, uh, what are the technologic, technology tools used by Reliance Foundation, especially on the ground? Well, uh, as part of our effort within the rural transformation space, uh, in fact, soon after we started this work on the ground in terms of engaging with the communities uh, closely and creating the community institutions to create that self-reliance and self-sustenance, we also launched uh, uh, a program, what we call Reliance Foundation Information Services. The primary objective of that uh, is to bridge uh, uh, asymmetry in the knowledge. Uh, just as I said, in the context of uh, income inequality and uh, inequality to access uh, uh, in terms of other uh, basic social infrastructure, uh, information asymmetry has also been a serious uh, issue when it comes to rural, rural communities. Well, a lot has happened over the last uh, eight years or so, uh, thanks to the technological evolution, ease of access to 4G network, uh, uh, wireless broadband, and so on. But uh, the primary uh, purpose of doing this was uh, how do we ensure that uh, the rural communities get access uh, to the in available information so that they secure their livelihoods. Uh, so it could be a farmer um, uh, wanting to protect the crop from a pest attack or uh, wanting to know more about uh, how do you enhance the productivity or, uh, or things like that, or even basic things like weather forecast well in time so that the farmer can act uh, proactively rather than uh, foregoing whatever has been uh, done often uh, during times of uh, heavy rainfall or otherwise. Similarly for fisher folk, we work a lot with fisher folk. Uh, so we uh, reach out in fact to 20% of the total fisher folk in the entire country. We operate uh, in all coastal states and uh, uh, th this has been a uh, transformational thing for the fish. So we have already established a platform using digital tools to reach out uh, the uh, marginalized communities uh, in remote parts of the uh, country. And that gave us uh, uh, the lever to basically address the current situation uh, that people are facing in the rural uh, part of India in terms of, let us say, if the farmers have got their crop, how do they reach their uh, produce to the markets? So uh, we can help them bridge and connect with the markets. And in fact, people have benefited uh, by using these platform more than they ever did in the past. Uh, so that's just one example of access to, better access to markets using technological uh, uh, platform. And uh, there are other things also like, for example, uh, it could be several government schemes that have been announced. The government has also announced various packages and so on. But there is a huge disconnect between uh, uh, 
uh, what's being uh, announced and what's reaching them because of lack of awareness or the lack of ability to connect with the right kind of people and sources to access those uh, things. So that's another part of it. And uh, it, it could be as sometimes uh, simple things like where are the relief uh, supplies available uh, for immediate uh, access. I mean, like this, there are many, many things uh, in times like this. COVID is a disaster, frankly, uh, in the country and globally, of course. So at times like this, it becomes even more uh, uh, useful. The technological platform becomes even more useful. So uh, whatever we have developed, capabilities we have developed, uh, we have been able to put them to great use during this uh, uh, period without people having to actually physically uh, uh, go to the places while maintaining social distance and uh, in, from remote places one could uh, provide all these uh, things to the people who needed them. So what the Science Foundation is doing, um, is it done uh, by themselves or you all engage with NGOs at the grassroots level and if so, uh, what are the criteria that you all engage or you all uh, uh, work with any NGO on the ground? So by and large, uh, we started off uh, uh, with an intent to do uh, things ourselves. Uh, that's with the belief that unless uh, uh, you have done it yourself and have established a model for development, uh, you wouldn't have something to show to the rest in terms of how it can be done and so on. And we have the strength in terms of execution as a group. Uh, in terms of doing things, projects. And so we brought our uh, corporate capabilities into uh, the social development uh, through our planning and execution and uh, so on. So that's what we started off with uh, and established that part of it. And having progressed there, then we uh, started working with uh, multiple organizations, uh, both the uh, Nonprofits as well as uh, uh, government and uh, in different states, uh, government departments, uh, and so on. Further, we also work with, uh, in addition to the government and NGOs, we work, work with a lot of uh, institutions, uh, such as, let's say, agri universities, uh, uh, as an example, uh, when it comes to agri livelihoods. Uh, so we work with nearly 1,000 such uh, institutions uh, across the uh, country, uh, institutions, KVKs, and uh, similar uh, organizations so, uh, to cater to the local uh, requirements, basically. It's uh, more in, it's in terms of both partnering for the purpose of uh, implementation as well as uh, partnering for uh, sharing of knowledge uh, from us to them and from them to us and uh, so on. We are also partnering with some state governments. For example, the government of Maharashtra is one example where we work with them on uh, the concept of uh, nutrition gardens to address malnutrition. Uh, what are the criteria that you look at when you partner with any NGO on the ground? It's about alignment of interests and uh, if we basically do these things in program mode. Uh, so if we want to achieve certain program objectives, we have to see uh, who are all the people who are operating in that region or area and see if there is an alignment in interest between them and us from the objective point of view and the implementation philosophy point of view and so on. If there is such an alignment, we can always uh, uh, work together and sometimes uh, it could be complementing each other. Uh, so we may bring certain strengths, others may bring some strengths and it could be complementing each other. And uh, so that's how we work. Um, so Reliance being the largest conglomerate uh, in India, it would be having a, a very complicated CSR and sustainability structure. Would you educate us? How does it really function inside the company and as a foundation? The foundation is the vehicle for uh, the implementation of the CSR uh, uh, mandate of Reliance Industries 
since the time the foundation came into existence and uh, has gone to this uh, stage. So uh, from an operational point of view, it's the foundation which has a team of people uh, who are responsible for this uh, implementation of the various uh, CSR uh, programs of uh, Reliance Industries. I mean, like uh, every corporate, uh, Reliance Industries being the largest private sector company in the country has uh, also got its uh, CSR uh, committee of the board, uh, which uh, uh, there is a CSR policy and there is a, uh, a framework that's been uh, uh, defined and uh, approved by the board in terms of uh, what are the things one uh, would do and how it's done and how, how it is uh, implemented, monitored, reported, and uh, so on the whole governance aspects. And it's like any corporate. And uh, so that's done uh, at the corporate level. But the foundation is primarily responsible for the implementation and uh, monitoring and reporting uh, aspects of the various initiatives. So uh, over the years, what has been um, the learnings and the success uh, at the foundation level on which projects? There are multiple projects. Uh, I mean, just let me continue on this since you started off with the rural uh, transformation. Uh, uh, so let, uh, within the rural law uh, space, uh, uh, let me give an example. When we started with agri livelihoods as uh, an important thing to be addressed, uh, so the underlying principle was to ensure sustainability. And uh, you know, it is sustainable agricultural practices, sustainable institutions, uh, and so on. So that uh, the communities are resilient in terms of uh, their income levels, and they are able to keep, uh, you know, manage with the situation from time to time. Uh, uh, in, in a sustainable way. So that's that's how we started off. So over a period of time, based on the various uh, things we have done, interventions uh, we have done, uh, you know, we are now uh, able to say that uh, we have actually established a clear model for uh, uh, climate smart villages, creating climate smart villages. So the climate smartness uh, really comes from on the point of view of how are you organizing yourselves to manage the resources better and how are you building resilience into this uh, and bringing sustainability in terms of whatever you are uh, doing. It could be uh, to do with uh, the use of uh, natural resources such as uh, uh, water, it, it could be use of uh, the Chemicals are actually we discourage, I mean, we encourage natural resource, natural way of uh, uh, farming, uh, so that the soil fertility and all that is protected. Soil erosion is uh, doesn't take place, uh, and so on. So there are multiple uh, things which are part of the intervention uh, that is uh, implemented there. And so we have, we can say we have actually done this uh, study ourselves and. Uh, now concluded that uh, we have been successful in terms of establishing um, these climate smart uh, villages. Um, you know, for the large sample of villages we have already studied and uh, analyzed, uh, one could say that out of the 560 villages, most of them are actually uh, climate smart uh, villages, including in terms of a, uh, you know, the use of information for the better information, as I said, uh, for uh, uh, better practices and uh, so on. There is the institutional capability, there is the information empowerment, there is the uh, there is better use of natural resources and uh, ecological uh, security, a whole lot of those things. That's, that's one of the uh, successful outcomes of uh, what we have uh, uh, done there. Then the second example I can give you is that of uh, uh, you know, former producer uh, companies. Uh, in all these places which are organized as clusters, we have helped the communities set up uh, uh, former uh, producer companies, uh, which is a concept uh, not new, uh, but at the same time did not gain as much momentum as one would have liked to see. Well, the government is putting emphasis on that now. 
so we organized uh, we helped them organize themselves into uh, this form of so companies with uh, membership from the farmers in the in this cluster of uh, villages and uh, build capacity in them in terms of taking ownership uh, establishing market linkages both forward and backward linkages so that the they capture the value both on the input side and the output side uh, uh, more efficiently rather than being captive uh, often to the markets or uh, uh, not being able to uh, get the benefit of uh, aggregation and uh, so on and they have also in turn ventured into small uh, commercial uh, activities uh, which is again part of the forward linkages uh, so that's another mode of uh, establishing sustainability there from an economic point of view so that they run their own businesses uh, uh, going forward so end to end uh, uh, you know approach basically in terms of uh, making sure that uh, their incomes are uh, secure so that's another example of success one could say so i csr has been mandated india is one of the first countries which has mandated csr in sustainability um uh, we being an institution what kind of courses do you see that uh, people in india or people in globally also would require to excel in this uh, space well uh, yes we are one of first country so maybe the first country to have actually mandated it uh, the way we did but if you really look at uh, uh, csr uh, space it's not like it was not happening prior to this uh, it has been happening uh, it is just that uh, this uh, this basically gives a defined framework in which one uh, has to do uh, while it has its uh, uh on merits uh, in terms of uh, uh you know having the framework for the sake of achieving certain uniform level of uh, support from the corporate sector uh, and channeling those resources uh, into the development uh, space for uh, the benefit of the communities it's also important to make sure that uh, those resources uh, are uh, used uh, in a very efficient way and most importantly uh, the corporates bring their innovation into the uh, development uh, space so in absolute terms the amounts uh, amount of money that can come from the entire csr pool across the country uh, in the context of the uh, overall development expenditure that is required may not uh, be significant enough but what is uh, significant is with those resources how do we also bring in uh, the corporate uh, best practices and innovations uh, uh, to the development sector such that uh, the people at the bottom of the pyramid really get the benefits of development that uh, the businesses can bring uh, not just through their products and services but by also uh bringing in those in, uh, innovations into the actual uh, development space so that's an opportunity that is there uh and uh, so far i think it's working fine in terms of uh, uh the indian corporates uh, adopting to this uh, new regulation it's no longer new it's now 6 year old uh and uh, we are seeing good results coming out of this uh, so yeah more more can be done obviously all the time uh, as i said uh, in terms of bringing in more innovations uh, into this the important thing is uh, if you are bringing in philanthropic money into development uh, then how, one has to always see how do we uh, you know make the best use of it every rupee that goes in here how much more can it deliver uh, so Uh, it needs to be a catalyst for change it needs to be a catalyst for development it needs to be able to mobilize more uh, resources uh, around uh, the money that is being invested around the efforts that are being put in by the corporate sector etc so the corporate sector could in effect be a kind of a convener as well in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, uh, integrated development uh, takes place uh, 
known for their innovative approach. So, what is a uh, if you could cite some um, social innovation projects that they have executed in foundation in the rural areas, in the urban areas, and otherwise? So, one uh, innovation which uh, I could talk of, which is very current, very recent, uh, uh, is, uh, for example. Uh, uh, most people are familiar with, again, I'll uh, continue on the rural uh, uh, development space for the sake of uh, uh, completing the conversation around it. Uh, so, most people are aware of uh, what is called a farm school uh, in the rural uh, areas, uh, particularly those who are dealing with rural development. This is not a new concept, it's been there for about 30 years, even in India. So the government uh, through ICAIR and uh, through the VKs operates these uh, farm schools uh, uh, to run pilots experiments in terms of seeing how the uh, farm productivity can be improved, what are the new practices uh, and what are the new practices they want to try and so on. And uh, uh, there has been a limitation in terms of how many people can uh, uh, be brought into this because of the sheer logistics issue. So if 25, 30 people per district can be brought into this through the old ways of doing this, uh, which has been happening for several uh, years, it will take us many decades to kind of uh, uh, see that this benefit reaches out to more people. And that is, uh, so we experimented with uh, uh, introducing a digital farm school. Uh, that was in collaboration with uh, a, a university um, and uh, the KBK, which is an extended arm of the ICAR. Uh, and our team basically uh, kind of created a uh, virtual digital form school. Uh, it's a virtual organization with virtual school, uh, people don't have to assemble in one place. Uh, and then you are not no longer limited to dealing with 25, 30 people. You can deal with a larger set of people in a larger geography simultaneously, provided their area of interest is common, such as if you are growing paddy, uh, there could be instead of 25, 30 from paddy farmers, you could potentially pick up any number of them. But for the sake of uh, this pilot part of it, we picked up 100 instead of 25. We said 100 people coming from 10 villages rather than just two villages kind of thing. So we expanded the scope of this. Uh, this is the numbers. A virtual organization steered by Reliance Foundation were in a virtual way and got the results. And we found uh, the net benefit being about 35, 34%. Uh, increase in net income through reduction in costs and increased uh, productivity uh, in one season. Okay, so this this is a, an innovation which is uh, which came out of our own activities with the farm community as well as with our digital platform uh, and with the same institutions that we have otherwise been uh, working with. Uh, so that's that's the kind of uh, innovations we can bring. This is what I meant when I said corporates can bring in uh, their uh, innovations and break the barriers, break the boundaries uh, in terms of uh, opportunities for uh, expanding, opportunities increasing, for increasing the scale as well as the impact. And through this process, one can easily monitor also as to what is going on there, uh, rather than the physical uh, means. And it so happened that COVID happened in the middle of this whole experiment. Uh, and it never disrupted anything. We started this uh, prior, prior to the season, and uh, towards the end of the season, COVID happened, uh, and obviously everybody was restricted from moving wherever they were, and never disrupted any work for us. Uh, so long as you have a phone uh, through which you can be reached and you can see video images uh, uh, and receive messages and you can talk, uh, you're set. Your, your, uh, you will continue to do whatever you were doing. So it was a seamless way of doing it uh, as if COVID never happened. Uh, so 
I mean, that's that's the kind of uh, things one could uh, talk or think of uh, in several ways uh, in different uh, areas of uh, work. I just pick this as an example. Uh, so it relates to the actual uh, rural part of it as well as the COVID and the technology and uh, stuff. Um, uh, that's a very great initiative. I, I wonder if uh, you could collaborate or you may be thinking of collaborating with government for the education system in the rural areas also. Well, that's, I mean, the possibilities exist always, right? <laughs> so platforms are always there. See, the important thing is uh, all of us, for all of us uh, to move into a platform approach. Okay, that's again an area where uh, corporates have strength and can bring these things together. What's the platform approach? Basically, it's about uh, uh, people with uh, respective strengths coming together for a common purpose. And it's a virtual platform. It, as, just as I told you in this particular example, uh, you don't need to be sitting in one place. So all that you need to agree on is what is my common purpose? It's a purpose-oriented platform organization, basically. And we bring all our uh, capabilities uh, uh, together uh, with the objective being uh, to deliver a particular outcome uh, in a location or in a ge large geography, whatever it is. So it is possible. Excellent, sir. Thank you so much for uh, answering all these questions. Now we would uh, open it up for the audiences. Uh, uh, we have one question from uh, Mr. Antariksh. Antariksh, would you like to come forward and uh, ask your question? Uh, please introduce yourself when you do so. Hello, sir. This is Antriksh. Right. So I would like to know about what are the uh, what are the plans of Reliance Foundation as this COVID-19 pandemic has struck in India. So are Reliance going to invest this in COVID-19 project, relief projects also? And what are the different uh, plans after this COVID-19 pandemic? I, mean, I don't know what you mean by COVID-19 COVID relief projects. So uh, there isn't... Uh, you know, as, as in, uh, yeah, COVID-19 has hit, hit the uh, lower lower class of pyramid also. So the relief for them system and growth generation on the village side and something like that. Sorry, what kind of relief are you talking about? See, laborers, my laborers have migrated to the villages and now they should be looking for employment at their very own villages and native villages yes. rather than you know, city vendor like that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, in fact, actually, there is work going on on that front. Uh, I'm sure many other organizations are also doing this. So, uh, again, uh, from our own uh, rural uh, engagement, uh, we have seen this happening uh, in terms of people coming back to the villages. Uh, though our original hope was that um, we would actually arrest migration by making farming also attractive for them. And But there were people who already migrated. and. So the, some of them have come back. And now what's been done to mitigate uh, along with the government is obviously uh, based with the uh, support of the government, local bodies, and so on, is to make sure that at least first they get the access to a Minraga uh, scheme, that is uh, the daily wage uh, scheme, that, so that they, they have some immediate uh, livelihood uh, available to them and uh, uh, some of the others are uh, being uh, supported as i mentioned earlier through the former producer companies that we have been working with in terms of uh, supporting and engaging with them on their uh, commercial uh, activities and so there is uh, that part of it uh, happening uh, already so it's about uh, accessing the right kind of uh, resources uh, and connecting these people uh, to those resources, those resources, so that they get uh, their livelihood. That's happening already. Thank you. Excellent. Question, Ms. Anjali Prakash. Uh, would you consider to come forth and switch on your camera? 
Cameron Pisa. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I had a question for Mr. Jagannatha Kumar. Uh, thank you for sharing all you did this afternoon. Uh, I am from Learning Links, and we work in education in 17 states across India. Uh, with the current COVID situation and the schools being shut, and the future looking like it will uh, be a new normal with hybrid forms of functioning for learning for children across India. We have come up with some models which will be a mix of face-to-face -face technology, hybrid uh, ways of learning to continue learning for children, every child in India. Uh, we are currently working with about 2 lakh students. The, what I'm sharing now or asking now is for a program that we do in the south with about 75,000 children. The only problem we are facing today for which we need immediate help or support is that the, uh, the reach and connect with all these children has already been established through WhatsApp. Now that is not sufficient for real uh, impactful learning to take it to the next level. We are wanting support on connectivity because with things opening up, the parents are taking the phones with them when they go for work. So children are at home, no device in the house, no connectivity in the house. So is there any way I could email you or send you this uh, model that we have worked on? And if there is any way of collaboration on your platform or device or with connectivity for these uh, 75,000 children. I mean, you may please mail, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, a larger issue which uh, the central government and uh, individual state governments are trying to grapple with. Uh, and while you're doing a great job in terms of uh, dealing with these 75,000 children in the South and a much larger uh, number of people elsewhere. But uh, one has to find a common uh, solution to this, uh, actually. And, uh, you know, we are hoping that the states uh, would come out with uh, something which is uh, practical, which is uh, it's ensuring, which will ensure that uh, the divide does not increase, basically. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, one has to really figure out what uh, can be done on that front. While you could write to me, but uh, what might be useful is that since you have already been doing this on the ground uh, with a large number of uh, students, uh, one of the ways to do is uh, to kind of uh, work along with a few other similar organizations in the states that you are uh, working in and see if uh, collectively, there can be something done uh, with, along with the state because uh, this needs to be this is this needs to be a long term solution. It will not be a, a quick fix, basically, uh, and it should be a natural transition to moving towards uh, the digital world in terms of uh, educational access. So I agree with you, sir, and uh, we are working closely with the state governments and collaborating with any organization who wants to work with us. Uh, but for us, we feel every day in a child's life is important. Yes. By the time those machineries come into action, these children are going through immense hardship today. So we are continuing with our model with the best resources we have today. But uh, the hope is that we garner support as soon as possible from larger corporates and organizations uh, because it is difficult time for all. And these are the children who are going to be impacted the most. Right. So if there is any thought, uh, I'll take your advice. But if there is any other thought in this matter, we would really welcome with your experience and uh, your know-how. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to connect with you, but I will uh, try and reach out on email. And if yeah, there is any please. option, we can explore. Yeah. Thank Go you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If you permit, I may share your email ID, so it will be helpful. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, we have the Dr. Kusnur over here with us. Uh, Dr. Kusnur, would you like to come forward? Yes, sir. Yeah, sure. Um, hello, Mr. Rao. Uh, you've been doing some brilliant work uh, in the foundation, especially your nutrition gardens uh, is a great initiative and uh, which will go a long way in terms of trying to identify micro level nutrition initiatives. So I have a question uh, for you. We are in the business of water and sanitation. And uh, recently we have started working uh, along with the Prime Minister's Employment Guarantee Program uh, to uh, fund uh, drinking water community systems and enable women self-help groups to vend water, uh, create livelihood for themselves and at the same time uh, provide clean drinking water. Just wanted to explore if there are opportunities uh, to work along uh, the villages where y'all are working and leverage this scheme and try and, uh, you know, provide clean water while uh, generating livelihood. That's one question. Second thing is uh, the uh, Corona pandemic had shown a lot of dearth of uh, public health workers, uh, you know, grassroots level public health workers. So we have created a course along with the HSNC University, which primarily talks- Sir, what university is that? Uh, the Hyderabad Sin National College at University. Mm -hmm. It's a new cluster university, which is which is comprises of HR, KC, National, and Dr. Niranjan Hirandani is the trustee of that. I'm the alumni of that university. Uh, we've created a course called as Swatch, which teaches in uh, rainwater harvesting, groundwater recharging, watershed management, sanitation management, community health, and most importantly, uh, you know, epidemic control in terms of a pandemic and maintaining hygiene, which are all critical elements for resilience post response. Uh, so we've created a short course, we're launching it very shortly. And uh, capacity building at the grassroots level is very important, especially with social distancing coming up and various other advisories which would come along. It's very important to have critical resource in the villages uh, who can act as uh, sort of uh, coordinators between multiple stakeholders and be custodians of uh, drinking water, sanitation, and community health assets. So this is a course which we have created. We just want local support with uh, you know, people who already have a community engagement. Um, we, the government is forthcoming with the new aggressive stance on the Prime Minister's Employment Guarantee Program, where the Honorable Prime Minister said that credit should be granted within 15 days, and we are probably closing the one next week in Interior Maharashtra. We wanted to just explore possibilities of, uh, you know, working alongside the great work that you've been doing and leverage the community engagement that you already have. And we'll share with you with what we're doing. Our technologies are totally sustainable. Our filtration system works without the power, works on gravity. And unlike reverse osmosis, it does not waste water and no sludge. Similarly, our bio toilets require only water for washing oneself. The fecal matter gets converted into liquid fertilizer through our bio process and flows down into the ground. And all our interventions have been sustainable for more than five to six years with very limited maintenance. And recently, UNGC appointed us as drinking water and sanitation partners. So we are looking for you know, partners who already have existing feet on the ground, who've got a community engagement, and there are a lot of government schemes which can be integrated. And together, if we can create a program which is sustainable, which is most important for us, uh, so that you know, we are one of the very few companies who have survived the drinking water and sanitation space, and on July 22nd, we complete 10 years of existence. And okay, nice. So, uh, so just just a question. Sounds good. And uh, so basically, you are looking for some support at the ground level uh, with the community engagement and exactly, so on, exactly. is what I have understood. Exactly. So you can kind of you share can share uh, these details. And what we can do is uh, wherever we have uh, common areas, as in geographical area. Sure, sir. Uh, you know, then we could we could look at those things, uh, uh, those specific geographies. Uh, so whether it's Maharashtra or any other states, uh, not a problem sir. that we are working in. And to the extent there is alignment, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, we'll be happy to get associated and uh, do this. Thank you very much. I'll drop in a line to you and sure. probably pick up a time from you and then call you sometime, sir. Sure. So I'll kind of probably thing. connect you with some of my colleagues. That's uh, fine, absolutely. And then you can take it. Not a problem. I'll just drop a line to you on this. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, uh, Dr. Kusnur. Wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you uh, so much, Asha.
Thank you. Thank you. We have our next question uh, with Dr. K.K. Upadhyay. Um, uh, Dr. Upadhyay for you. We can't hear you, sir. Dr. Upadhyay, we can't hear you. No, no, we can't hear you. Remove the headphones. Maybe then we'll be able to hear you. Hello. Can you hear me yeah. now? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, Mr. Kumar, I know Reliance Foundation for very long as I have been associated with FIKI. I was head CSR with FIKI. You have been doing an excellent job. Even before the, it became a law, you were spending a lot of money. Even now you spend 4 to 5%, whereas required is only 2%. You are one of the biggest uh, spender uh, in mandatory CSR also. And over a period of time, you have changed, like say, Tata Trust. They are not working directly with NGOs and others now. Uh, they have their own programs and they work directly with the communities, uh, giving service to the communities uh, directly. And there has been a talk about working together, as you also said when you were mentioning about the rural transforming project of our reliance, it's a time when we should work together, whether it's government or corporate, the corporate foundations or the communities, NGOs. I would like to know from you, as a social development professionals, we have been seeing this field for almost now 40 years. I'm from the first batch of Irma, so started uh, working with Dr. Korean's uh, operation flood, then moved to Mother Dairy, had a suffer. Over a period of time, it has taken a course. What do you advise we, the development professionals, what should we do and what is future for us? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very loaded question, actually. I think... Uh, uh, there is no dearth of work to be done, frankly, uh, on, in the development space. As all of us know, uh, there is so much more to be done. While a lot of work is happening, there is so much more to be done. So particularly with people like you who have seen a cooperative movement from close quarters, if you are an alum of uh, IRMA, uh, you couldn't have been any closer to what has happened, how uh, Anand, Amul, all these transformed uh, in these uh, 40 years. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's evident and that's in front of us. So, in fact, you know, the development part uh, can, as I mentioned earlier, while corporate sector can come in, government is doing what it can and it should. Uh, there is what I call a PPP. Four, four P's, uh, right? Uh, so generally PPP is what is commonly used, public-private participation. Uh, but there is an additional uh, P, which is that of people. When you say public-private participation, typically it is the government or its affiliates, uh, and the private is typically seen as the private sector, as in a more organized or semi-organized kind of uh, thing. But the people part, uh, you know, is kind of uh, implicitly taken for granted in the sense that uh, all these people believing that they are doing for the good of the people, but then what is it that the people are looking for and what are their priorities and how do they want to see these happening uh, with the available resources? And uh, they are essential part of the, uh, they are the most essential part of ensuring sustainability actually to take these things forward because uh, they are also not looking forward for uh, what you call uh, just philanthropy. They are looking forward for solutions, they are looking forward for uh, help, guidance, capacity, etc. to uh, pull themselves up from where they are. So uh, the reason I brought this up, this whole piece and the people part into the discussion is uh, uh, to uh, bring that uh, uh, to uh, address this part this people participation along with the public and private you need people who can relate to all these aspects now if you have been in development uh, space for 40 years and you are an alum of Dima and 
fantastic. You understand the public part, you understand the private part, you understand the people part. Of it. So you, these development professionals are uh, have the opportunity and the ability to actually bring all these together so that there are sustainable solutions. And everybody works towards innovations uh, which make sense for the people and they can take it forward from there rather than each of these things being seen as temporary solutions or quick fixes and uh, so on. That's what will ensure longevity of uh, the uh, results actually. So that's where I see the role of uh, the development uh, professions because you understand the space uh, uh, well. Uh, you understand the participatory role of the process. You understand all the works uh, that are part of this. So that's that's where uh, actually opportunity exists. And in fact, there is a lot more than what would have been possible uh, maybe a decade ago, two decades ago. And it could be a good bridge between uh, the people and the institutions, public or private. So nice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Padhyay, for being with us today. Uh, may I request Mr. Avanish Kumar uh, to come forward and ask his question? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asha. And uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Kumar. My question is related uh, to more of the CSR Act kind of thing. So the act actually says that you know the activities can be preferably done in the vicinity or the periphery of the project, and sometimes in the you know in the CSR committees and board also prefers that. Uh, but we see that Reliance Foundation activities are spread all over India, and you have you know so many agriculture activities and everything happening in different regions and all that. So uh, how have you been able to convince the companies? Do have you faced any challenge? or you have some formula that at least this much would be in the periphery and rest of the thing can be you know in different parts of the country as that uh, anything uh, would like to guide us on but i think uh, uh, the intent is to make sure that you are basically taking care of your communities in the neighborhood certainly yes and uh, uh, while you do that doesn't mean that you should not be doing uh, anything for uh, the rest of the country where there is a need for uh, finding solutions and addressing the gaps and uh, so on. When, when I gave this example of rural, we really picked up some of the most underdeveloped, uh, somebody needs to go. In fact, what I have not said, but what we did, uh, in fact, as part of our design is to go to a place where there is nobody already working, mm -hmm. other than the government, of course. Government always is there everywhere. Uh, I mean, through local bodies and whatever. So you need to bridge that divide uh, as responsible corporates, as responsible citizens, individuals also. All of us need to address the needs of the uh, needy in terms of uh, fixing uh, and bridging that uh, gap. So it is not at the cost of not doing what you have to do uh, around your business, but uh, going beyond that. So I would, I actually categorize this whole effort into three parts. Mm -hmm. What you do uh, for the business, what you do as part of the business and what you do beyond the business, right? So what you do for the business, you will always do. What you do as part of the business also you will do. I mean, what you do as part of the business is like creating, you know, products and solutions which uh, uh, make sense for the users, for the communities and benefit the communities uh, and so that you're, you're catering to your consumer, consumers uh, on a sustainable basis. What you do for the business is like what you said, okay, if I'm operating in a place, am I also taking care of my stakeholders in the neighborhood and so on. And what you do beyond the business is what I said, like, you know, you can't just ignore uh, another set of people, just because there has been no industry there, there has been no business that is uh, there. So that's an effort, basically, to make sure that uh, even they are taken care of. It's an inclusive uh, growth approach, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Beyond the business is the approach that we have. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, thank you, Mr. Avanish, for being with us today. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Anil Jaggi to come forward and ask his question? Uh, yeah. Good evening, uh, Mr. Kumar. Uh, this is Dr. Anil Jaggi. Right now, I'm based in uh, Uttarakhand, a city called Dehradun, and I have been watching uh, the activity Lions Foundation is doing in, in the, during the disaster of Uttarakhand uh, from 2013. Uh, my uh, question here is uh, in the whole ecosystem of development. Uh, the role of NGO is, I feel, is very, very important. And I think that uh, everybody agrees on that, that the role of NGO is very, very important in, as far as uh, execution is concerned. Uh, I was just going through one study and one survey done by the EY, uh, Ernest and Young. They said that 75% uh, corporates are finding it very difficult to identify and partner the local partners, especially the NGOs. So they're not very clear in the system and the process is not very clear that to how to identify the NGOs or the NGOs selected are also not very, uh, very genuine. So government of India is also during the peace time. Uh, government of India is also um, always after the NGOs that NGOs are fraud or NGOs are working like this. Uh, but during the, this kind of pandemic or this kind of disaster, even the Niti Aayog and every government organization is, all, uh, is asking NGOs to come forward and support uh, the local NGOs, uh, local uh, programs. So uh, what is your suggestion? What is your uh, inputs on that? Because you have been working with the local NGOs, I believe in Uttarakhand also, in Kedar, Kedarnath Valley also. Uh, so how to identify NGOs and how to have a right kind of uh, uh, you know, trust between the corporates, NGOs, as well as the government. So what are you saying? What are your findings? What is your benchmarking on that? So this is my question. So it is, uh, I mean, it's an old uh, uh, traditional way of uh, uh, looking at these things in terms of uh, evaluation when it comes to evaluation. Well, on paper, of course, you will have to do many, many things uh, to make sure they're credible, uh, they're genuine, and all those things, those have to be anyway done. Uh, but at the same time, it's also important to have that connect in terms of seeing actually the kind of work that people are doing. There is no shortcut to that. Uh, you have rightly observed about what we have done in Uttarakhand in the Kedar, not uh, the Prayag district. Um, so the uh, we we have closely observed the work we have done, uh, the uh, the organizations have done, and uh, then brought them into what whatever we are uh, doing and uh, what we started off with and subsequently continued with and so on. So there is no shortcut to that. It's a uh, it's an involved process. Uh, uh, it can't be done just uh, uh, by looking at a piece of paper and uh, so on. So it, it happens through close engagement and understanding the objectives of the organization and uh, how uh, has their track record been in implementation and so on. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's why I said it's a traditional or old way of uh, doing these things, there is no shortcut to that really. And I can ask yeah. you, this rate uh, of selecting the NGOs and uh, what kind of parameters uh, so that other corporates, especially the corporates, uh, NGOs, I feel is that uh, that's a very important uh, link between the development sector, uh, corporate sector, as well as the grassroots sector. So, the, and this many, many NGO, many, many corporates, including the, you know, the PSUs are also finding it difficult to identify the NGOs. And there's a lot of due diligence process is also there. But uh, just to simplify the process, uh, would you like to share some of the good example uh, so that other NGOs, other corporates also understand uh, like what is your parameters? And there are many, benchmark? many. See, uh, they, as I said, no, they, from evaluation point of view, if there is a track record of doing things consistently and delivering what they have been promising, and those are things, uh, as I said, which are not necessarily seen on paper. You have to go there and see actually what is happening. You will have to hear the people talking about it. Uh, and these are these are things which one has to necessarily see. I mean, so that's that's exactly what we do. Uh, we don't necessarily go by, and we are not a grant-making organization. Uh, so we are, and as I mentioned in the beginning. We started off as an organization which wanted to do things itself, but uh, over a period, we have also brought in NGOs uh, to work alongside. So since we are not a grant-making organization, we expect people to work along with us. 
uh, and not just look for any money that uh, comes from us. Uh, and so they, they have to share, uh, share their plans and understand what we are trying to achieve there and, uh, you know, uh, bring their resources and we support them in terms of our capacity and all those uh, things. So it's a genuine partnership that way. Uh, so it's not a transactional thing, really speaking. When it gets transactional, then you have potential issues around, uh, you know, the genuineness and all of this. So, but here, if we are really working together and we are jointly responsible for delivering the outcomes, then people have to uh, do it the hard way. Good. good. So you. you uh, the capacity building for the NGOs because as uh, I was uh, listening to Anjali Prakash also, as she mentioned about uh, some uh, grassroots activities, 75,000 uh, students to be covered. And uh, with the changing time, uh, with a lot of technologies, with a lot of, you know, the innovations coming in. And it is very important to uh, build the capacity of the local grassroots NGO, CSO. Uh, so are you doing this kind of activity also for... Uh, not, uh, not purely for the purpose of capacity building of NGOs, but it is around a purpose of... Uh, doing a particular program in a location. location. So if an NGO, uh, let me give, take an example of this uh, nutrition garden. If an NGO wants to be part of this mission, then we will help them in terms of getting the tools, techniques, and all that stuff. And then they can also be an interface between the local uh, community and the government department and uh, so on so that the thing program is carried out smoothly and the intended benefits uh, uh, reach the people that uh, they have to reach. So that's the way we do this. It's not like an academy where we say that this is the module we are running and then we'll train 100 NGOs kind of thing. It is really program driven. That's the way we do this. And we do this uh, in different uh, ways, uh, depending on what is that particular uh, initiative that they want to engage themselves in, along with us. It's all joint, as I said. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any final message for our uh, viewers would you have? Oh, from me? Okay. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm yeah. sure all of them are uh, experienced uh, uh, and I, I from the questions that I have answered so far, I found that many of them have uh, years of experience uh, in terms of being uh, in their respective areas. So from my side, the only thing I can say is that from my experience, uh, which may not match in fact the experience of some of them in their respective areas, uh, is that uh, the need of the hour is really for us to uh, bring innovations into development and use uh, CSR really as a vehicle uh, to uh, transfer and translate those innovations coming from businesses or uh, other sources in terms of ensuring that the bottom of the pyramid people uh, get all the benefits of development that is taking place otherwise around us. And we really bridge this divide uh, between the communities. So how best can we bring those innovations to the ground? And uh, how do we then, how do we leverage uh, the operate uh, capability to get that um, into execution? So these are the areas really one, one needs to think of. Uh, including the example I mentioned about the development professionals. So there is a lot of bridging that needs to be uh, done. I think uh, if we do that, then for the amount of money that's going into CSR from the corporates of the order of 10,000 crores plus whatever, then you can see a multiplier effect coming out of it uh, using this as a catalyst and uh, getting many uh, results manifold. Uh, uh, along with the government, NGOs, communities, uh, uh, and all those things. That, that's, that's the only thing I would uh, look for. I would say social ownership is a way forward for all of us. Sorry? Uh, 
may I request everyone to switch on their cameras so the community gap. Okay, may I request everyone to switch on their videos so we can take a group picture with uh, Mr. Kumar. Okay, usually I'm looking down and I'm looking at the camera. That's how it happens. So, uh, so we go now. Say cheese. Okay. Thank you so much. I will be sharing this with uh, all of you all, and uh, it's been a great pleasure to have all of you all with us today in the evening. And thank you, Mr. Kumar, for joining us. Thank you. And wish you all good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.